Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well. I hope everyone's ready for this tasting this evening. Um, last week's was good fun. We had those mid-bodied reds we tried last week. Uh, and I think the jury was kind of split on who preferred what. I was uh, I was all about the French, but uh, I know there was a good number of people that preferred the, um, the Greek as well. So I thought it was a good result overall. Uh, everyone seemed pretty happy. Now this week we are going for a 50-50 split of wine. So as I said the other day, we're going for a white and a red this week um, and we are in Portugal this week. So we're staying with the nice old world hot countries, um, probably partly because I'm dreaming of being on holiday in these places at the moment. So that's why I wanna talk about them and just imagine I'm there. Um, it's gonna be a while before I get somewhere like that, I imagine, so yeah. I'm just going to talk about these places instead and we can all dream, all right? So tonight, there's a few of you joining in, um, as I gather. Um, so you should have your your white wine ready, uh, hopefully chilled, um, not too cold. I like to have mine about 15, 16 degrees. No, I'm lying. That's my reds. I like my whites to be about um, 7, 8 degrees. So tonight, if you've got your... Descoberta Branco, about that, that'd be fantastic. And you're right, if it's sitting at room temperature at the moment, brilliant, okay? So first off, we're gonna talk about the white wine. So the Descoberta Branco. Um, now this one is, for me, it's just here. I'm just gonna grab mine so I can show you. Just got mine sitting in a little chiller at the moment, actually. It was, uh, I left it in the box by the front door, <laughs> like a fool, uh, until earlier. So here's mine. So yeah, this is the Descoberta, um, and this one is an Encruzada grape, okay? Um, it's a little blend. It's got a bit of a Malvesia, Malvesia Fina in it as well, and it's got some Verdeo in it as well, but it's primarily an Encruzada. So this little white wine. So where's it from? It's from Dow, the Dow region, okay? Um, now this we discussed the other day is, is primarily a red grape region. Um, it's where a lot of the Trigo Nacional is grown for your ports. Um, so I think it's 20% of the output only is white wine, which is kind of cool. So what I didn't want to do, I suppose, was visit Portugal and have the same old, same old, you know, and try the reds that we expect to get from an area where they produce these reds and, and try the whites where everyone buys their white from. So I wanted to kind of mix up a little bit um, if, if I could, and this one is certainly an unusual one and from all accounts the whites that come from the Dow region are unusual and can be quite interesting these days I think they used to be probably fairly forgettable by the sounds of it but these days it sounds like people have really striven to to, to demonstrate the grapes characteristics and really see what they can do with it so this one grown by Casa Passera as I said um, who were founded in 1892 now these guys are located um, in the Gavea district, which is, as I said, in Dao, and that is southeast of uh, the town called Viso, if you know that, um, right on the edge of the Serra de Estrela National Park. Um, so we're up on a high plateau, we're surrounded by mountains, okay? Um, so a lot of you are pretty familiar with the Douro, I think, right? The Douro Valley, I know a lot of you've been there and, and told me about your trips, and it sounds, sounds amazing. Um, and you're familiar you'll be very familiar with how hot that place gets, right? So the Dao is different. It's, you know, you look on the map, it's not a million miles away. It borders pretty close to stuff, but uh, pretty different. Uh, it's classed actually as a dry continental climate. Um, it's protected primarily from the heat of the Douro by the mountains. So to the north of the region, you've got the Serra de, de Nave mountain range that stops that, that heat from Duro coming down and barreling down and hitting the, uh, these vineyards. So a lot of that, that humidity and that heat is kept away. Um, and then you've also got the, as we mentioned, the Cerro de Estrella to the southeast, I think, and the Cerro de Azor along the southern border, which similarly protect the region from um, a lot of the hot winds that come in from Spain and I, I think uh, and to, where is it um, Atanjeo as well so down south so it's, it's really protecting 
protecting the grapes from, from this region, from the south and from Antahia region, which we'll talk about later. Um, so stopping those hot winds coming across there. And similarly um, to the, um, the Atlantic side, so if we're talking westward, there's um, the Serra de Caramulo, I think, or Caramulo or something like that they're called. They protect the region from the cooler winds coming off the sea, um, bringing the rains and stuff. So, you know, we've, we've got a real microclimate going on here. We're up on a plateau. We've got a, a wall of mountains around this place, protecting it from overheat from the north and from the south and southeast, and protecting it from the cooler climate from the west. So it's, it's really um, its own little unique climate. In addition to that, obviously, you've got the Dow Valley, River Valley. There's, a, there's three rivers that cut through the area, and Dow being most notable for us, where it gets the name from. Um, and these uh, river valleys cut through the region and through the plateau. Um, I think taking the the the, um, the depth down to or the elevation down to around two hundred meters above sea level, where they really cut out these gorges. Um, and the maximum I think elevation we find on the plateau is about seven hundred meters. Our our valleys or our our, our, our vines are probably growing about five hundred meters on average around sea level. Um, but what the rivers do with these river valleys is obviously again bring this microclimate in and this this moderating um, factors which all contribute to different microclimates in the region. Um, so not to be not to be confused with regions very close by that maybe suffer from too much heat or too much moisture. For example, um, Barriada, directly to the east of this region, really suffers from the Atlantic. Um, and, and for the grape growers there, and they do grow grapes there, they really have to uh, battle the, the weather that comes in from the Atlantic. The guys here in the Dow are really well protected, especially in this plateau we're talking about, where um, Discobertus grown. So up on this plateau, what have we got soil-wise? Well, it's gonna be pretty self-explanatory. It's granitic soil, so granite-based soils. Um, so we're talking sparse, loose, easy draining, infertile, poor quality. Um, as you know, this is kind of exactly what we want. Um, it's said that there's, no, I've not been there, but it's said that there's uh, scatterings of um, of kind of quartz and mica and feldspar and stuff through the soil, which, which gives it this kind of glittery uh, appearance, sparkly appearance. So when you're walking around the vineyards, you see these glitters of uh, the stones flashing through the soil, which sounds really cool. Um, I'd love to go and see it. Um, one of our viewers, hopefully tonight, is uh, Brian. Brian, planning to go that way. I take it. If you are, do let me know if this is true. If the soil sparkles at you, I'd love. I'd love it if it does. It sounds like a dream. So the vinification on this one, um, hand picking. So the grapes are hand picked, which is always a good start. Often that's a, a sign of a, a, a grower or vineyard that um, like to be hands-on or or be more traditional in their approach, I guess, um, which is true, I think, with these guys to a degree. So once everything's ripe, um, they go around hand-picking. The good thing about this region, the interesting thing about this region, you know, I was saying just now, just, just a bit of a diversion here, with the ripeness of the grapes, um, the altitude and the massive fluctuation in diurnal temperatures uh, it's about 20 degrees, I think, difference in temperature between day and night regularly, that's your average. What that does for the region is it means that actually it's really well suited area to grow all sorts of grapes, reds, whites, but with a distinctive style, what, what this diurnal range of temperature does is slows down the grapes maturation uh, and elongates the growing season, which means that we keep our acids. The acidity in the grapes is good, it gets time to develop, the, the skin gets time to develop properly and that is where your, acid, your acidity is going to be coming from. Um, so what we're finding here is once these wines are, once these uh, grapes are ripe, they hand pick, they've got good acidity still, whether they're white or red. And the, the region is actually pretty famous for that, I think, and that, that is all um, completely down to the geography and the terroir, which is, you know, one of the things that we talk about often, how, how amazing that is. That, the effect of the terroir on the grape. You know, it's so notably different based from one area to the other because of things like 
the local river valley, the uh, diurnal temperature changes, the the type of soil. It's, it's I love it, as you know. So back to the vinification. Um, Hand-picked. Um, now the grape varieties, so there's three grapes in here. We've got the Encruzado, we've got the... Um, the Fina and we've got the Verdeo and uh, these are, they're left together initially. Part of the vinification is they're left together. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're, uh, they're crushed gently and then they're left uh, in skin contact with the juice for a while. Now what that will do is impart a little bit more flavor to the wine. If you leave the skin in contact with the, with the juice, it does impart a bit more flavor. Um, it can impart more color depending on the colors of the grapes and stuff as well. So you know, red wine, for example, obviously, they leave the grapes in there, the colour of those dark blue grapes and red wine leaks out, that's where the colour's coming from. Um, and where your tannins and stuff come from, from the skin. With white wines, they tend not to leave skin in at all, or very briefly, to give a little bit of a, a characteristic to it, and that's what they're doing here. Um, once they've done this, they will pop these into um, steel vats, they leave the lee in, so they don't rack this wine off the lee, they leave the lee in, so as you, we've discussed before, this is your leftover dead uh, yeast cells and uh, small pieces of uh, stalk and so on, left on the bottom in the steel vats for six months, um, which will have what effect? It's gonna soften the wine, right? Um, it just adds to a little bit of a softening process, drops the, uh, the acidity to add a little notch maybe here and there, um, but they don't like to do much else, these guys, uh, as, I, as I understand it. They don't really um, inter, interject with the wine much more than that. They like to be quite hands-off. Um, so they are practicing organic, uh, maybe biodynamic as well. They're not certified, but they're practicing. And if you've talked to me about this before, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that having a wine that is certified organic or certified biodynamic, depending on where you are in the, in the world, means that much. Um, sometimes it's just a bit of paper, especially in, in France stuff. You know, I've heard some horror stories about vineyards like that that really go through the hoops to just get a bit of paper. It doesn't really make much difference in terms of their practice. They just want that it's trendy and it's fashionable to have this, this certification so they get it and then they go back to whatever they're doing before. I think in, in my books, if they're practicing and they're not worried about going to get the certification, in some cases that often means they're probably doing more than they would if they got the certification, they could relax a bit of rest on the laurels. You know, they're, they're really putting into practice what they preach, if you like. So yeah, these guys, I think, are, are definitely along those lines. Now, I'm, uh, I'm about ready to pour this, I think, so I'm gonna grab this out my chiller. Oh, hope, hope it's got a little bit of chill to it. Yeah, that's actually lovely, lovely temperature. See, my glass wash has been uh, up to their old tricks again. Glasses aren't that clean, I'm afraid. So, first off the bat, here she is. I'm gonna have a look at the color of this now. Uh, let's have a wee look here. So it's, it's a nice kind of lemony color, tinged with a bit of green, actually. For me, I'd say there's definitely a little bit of a green color to that, which um, may be it may be a fact of the, the slight skin contact at the start that I was just saying can impart a little bit of colour. But yeah, it's definitely got a kind of a fresh looking green colour to me. Um it, yeah it looks quite lively actually for me. Now this one is a it's a 13% so I think yeah we got a 13% here so I don't see it looking too viscous in the glass you know it's um it's looking like it's moving quite well. So I'm gonna have a little smell of this one. Wow, that's surprising. Woo, that's a big one. It's, uh, it's really lively and green smelling, like really refreshing smelling actually. It's livening me up. Who needs coffee? I'm just gonna start smelling this in the morning instead. Not drinking it, of course. Just smelling it in the morning. Drink it later. But it's really a lively smell. It's, it's quite kind of, it's got a bit of minerality to it. Um, but it's almost got that green kind of gooseberry smell, um, maybe like fresh, this sounds really silly, but like imagine you getting some fresh rosemary and crushing it and smelling that, that kind of really fresh pungent green smell. It's, it's got a little bit of that going on, I think. Uh, and definitely citrus for sure. You know, it's, it's definitely got your hallmark citrus flavors, what smells going on in that. You know, if you have a Deo before, you know what the smell of that is, right? It's a kind of a young green smell. It's got that hint in there as well. 
I'm going to give it a taste. Wow. But, um, yeah, it really, really delivers on what the, the smell is for me. So very fresh in the mouth, really crisp, good structure, good backbone to it. It's got very firm freshness, if you know what I mean by that. It's not a, a fleeting little thing in your mouth and then it's gone. It's solid freshness. Definitely getting stone fruits in there. Um, yeah, almost like uh, underripe, but um, peaches or something going on in there. And yeah, nice crisp green apples as well, I'm getting. A lovely bit of citrus and it's it's not um, overly sweet or sickly. It's light in the mouth actually. I'm gonna try again just to confirm that. All in the interest of research. Yeah, it's light in the mouth. It's really refreshing actually, I love that. Um, and the finish doesn't doesn't go away you know it's just a nice length on this finish it's um it's crisp and dry and i'm just letting it kind of develop a bit there and it's it's not losing anything for me the apples are kind of coming to the surface you know as we go on with that one so i'm i like that i'm very surprised at uh, how fresh it is given the the country it's grown in um and having had wines from the south of spain so not too far away you know from mid and southern Spain before with white wine styles, they're not, this is quite different. So yeah, I like that a lot. Big fan, and we'll come back to that in a moment. I mean, just before I finish actually, I would say, if you guys are eating tonight and you're gonna maybe have some food, um, for me, you know, this, uh, this tapas wine, um, I think it would be fantastic with um, chicken or pork skewers, you know, tapas style would be awesome with this, or even uh, some nice, um, barbecue chicken uh, for me I would I could see myself having that with um, I don't know maybe a paella fish paella would work for me for sure so yeah if you are going to have dinner with that there's some thoughts now we'll leave that for a moment and we're going to go on to our second wine the red um, which is here and here it is so this is the Pie Tinto um, from Asparal now this one is from a very different region so this one is from the Alentejo region. Um, you, may, you may remember a moment ago I mentioned this, that the, the mountain ranges in Dao protect it from these hot hot winds coming up from that region. It's split into several areas. I mean, the, the Alentejo region is, uh, it takes up a third of Portugal's landmass, pretty much. Um, so we're talking just north of the Algarve and it stretches up all the way into the, towards the center of the country um, and out to the west. It's, it's a huge area and it's got all sorts of different climates in it. Um, primarily warm, there are some diurnal temperature ranges in the higher areas where you can maybe get some more complexity in the wines. This one is, um, where about, it's just the Mora region, I think, which is near to the Spanish border. If you're thinking of Spain and you're thinking of, say, Seville or somewhere like that, it's northwest on the map um and it's yeah it's uh it's on the one of pretty much the hottest part i think of, of the region of the Alentejo region it's famed for its scorching summers um now they're famous for um for their reds in this area they do grow some white grapes but they're famous for the reds um famous for a particular style of red as well all right um no they, they do grow a lot of aragones and stuff out there as well and they also import a lot of grapes in and grow them so you've got your foreign grapes like your cabernet sauvs and stuff like that they grow there in the merlots of course this one is has a little bit of aragonas in it as we said the other day um but it's mainly i think it's the trincadera grape in this one and that's a, a local grape a local variety um, which is used in it is used in port and they do grow that in the duro as I said the other day, it's, it's, it's difficult to grow under the Duro climate because it really, really, really wants hot, very dry climate to grow in at its best. Otherwise it gets susceptibility to rot, which I think in Duro is probably more likely to happen. Where this is in the Mora region, it's perfect. So I think that hence 
the grape is, is the primary grape in this one. Um, so the area where this is grown is very famous for its kind of soft approachable styles of red. Um, famous in Lisbon as well. So if you've been up to Lisbon and you've had your reds over there and you've been to your little tapas bars and you've had these smooth, nice, easy going reds around 13%, which is what this is probably from that region could even be from the Mora region where this is from um now i'm thinking um 13 percent isn't going to taste particularly huge and full bodied but i don't know the jury's out for the moment because that's what the area is famous for but 13 percent, i don't know um it's famous for also for its kind of rustic style so i'm expecting this to be a little bit of a local style maybe a little bit rustic Maybe not as polished as uh, some of the kind of the smoother, more um, common California reds and stuff like that you might get um, that you used if you like your smooth big reds. Now the area is interesting because uh, even though it's the old world, technically Portugal, Portuguese wine, old world, as I think I might have mentioned the other day, it's um, it's quite similar in its climate to, 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 to southern Australia and places like that, right? So it's very hot, very dry. Uh, and the way it turns its grapes out is actually pretty similar in style to those regions. So a lot of people do compare these Portuguese wines to your New World Red. So if you do like your New World Red and you come into the bar, to see me and you always a bit like, oh man, Phil, stop trying to get me to drink this old world stuff, man. I want something from the New World. This this could be our bag because, you know, maybe I, I get to buy an old world wine, which I love. And you get to drink a New World style wine. Could be the best of both worlds, guys. So... The Morau region, as we say, uh, Morau region is it's pretty low down. Uh, there's some rolling hills where we are here, but it's pretty low down. It's not a huge diurnal temperature range. There's a lot of heat. Um, so the grapes are going to be maturing fairly quickly. And I think there's going to be quite a lot of sugar in this personally, because with that much sunshine, the grapes are going to have a lot of residual sugar going on. And I think um, if I'm right, it's around eight eight grams per litre which is pretty high and, and also interestingly i think they have high acidity i think this is like over six six grams per litre which sub, on both sides there the the uh, the acidity and the residual sugar are both pretty high actually relatively speaking so i'd be very interested to see how this one how, how it pans out to be honest um in terms of the vinification of this one guys it's it's fairly straightforward this one it's nothing 100 percent flashy or anything nothing crazy going on here they're not they're not doing any uh, organic or biodynamic farming. So this one, the Aspora house is uh, maybe a negotiation or a collective. From what I gather, this particular wine is drawn from around 20 different vineyards. So the grapes are, whilst they only use three varieties, they can be taken from different vineyards. Um, it's not one house growing the wine, okay? So in terms of the production of it, Again, I'd imagine this is a wine that probably gets taken over to Lisbon a lot and sells like the bar by the barrel load probably. So they're not um, they're not hand picking this. This is I think primarily machine picked, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, they are not old vines. We're not talking old vines here. Um, the soil is poor again. Um, the soil I think is is limestone. We've got some schist, um, and again we've got a little bit of. Um, kind of granite going on there. So the, the vines will be working relatively hard, but I think it's, it's much more of a kind of a table wine style for the region, perhaps. We'll see, all right? Um, so yeah, this one, uh, again, it's steel tanks. Um, they are left for four months, I think, um, in the steel tanks. Um, it's not left on the lee. It's malolactic fermentation, this one. So we talked about that last week, I think. Um, so the malic acids are converted to lactic acids by the addition of um, some friendly bacteria during the fermentation to soften the wine a little bit, all right, and take some of the tannins out. Because the thing with red grapes is they've got a lot of tannins. That's why people like red wine. It gives it that structure and that bite to it. But um, I think because it's only four months in steel tanks and they've taken it off the lee, Malolactic fermentation is going to give you some smoothness that maybe would have been difficult to achieve in this time frame. Now, having said all that, let's pour this. We need to crack on. Because I know everyone's dying to get tasting. Wow, look at that colour straight away, nice. Um, okay, so the colour, 
throwing this around. The color is, is quite a light red, actually. Um, a nice mid-body red. I can smell it as well straight away. Um, yeah, lovely kind of mid, mid, mid ruby color there. Lovely um, young, and this is a 13, and it's a, I think it's a 2019. It is, so it's really young. This is last year's harvest. So it's fresh off the fields. Beautiful color, like almost a bit pinkish on the edges there. The nose, yeah, I'm already getting it over here, which is which is cool. Nice, so uh, yeah, we're getting some strawberries straight off the bat. Some red fruit. Um, maybe some, some sort of the juicier, darker fruit, some juicy dark berries or something going on in there. Um, a little hint of, yeah, a little hint of spice actually there in the background as well. It, it smells like sunshine, you know? I'm gonna have a little taste. Uh oh, that's a quaffing wine. That's dangerous. Um, so we got some black cherries going on there. Oh, it's nice. It's it's quite light, but got the body to it. You know what I mean? That that residual sugar with the malolactic fermentation there makes it a nice kind of. Not overly sweet, strangely enough, not overly sweet, but it's, it's a nice, smooth, gentle finish. It's a gentle in the mouth wine, this one. Even though the acidity is quite high, it's well balanced by that residual sugar. Um, and there's no harsh tannins in this, man. It is it's smooth, there's nothing harsh going on. And for a wine that light, you know, if, you, if you're looking at old world wines and you get a light red like that, um, you know, if we're talking about a Gamay or something like that, often the tannins are still there, this is, surprisingly smooth. It's got a bigger wine smoothness that you expect from a 14 or 14 and a half percent that's had time to smooth out. The finish on it is nice. I'm, I'm still getting some, some lovely flavors here. So the black cherries, I'm getting some, some lovely blueberries actually. Yeah, yeah, hints of blueberries going on there. Um, definitely a bit of red fruit as well. There's a bit of strawberry in the background uh, and a tiny hint of spice, but nothing really, you know, um, yeah, nothing really. But if anything, almost a kind of a plummy finish on it, which is interesting for a young wine. Um, finish is good. I mean, it's light. It's not sticking around too long. There's nothing unpleasant going on. There's a bit of strawberry left in my mouth now. That's nice. With this one, I can totally see it working um, in 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 a little tapas bar with yeah some beef, maybe um, yeah maybe some meatballs or something like that would be lovely. Actually, really good. Um, you can tell I miss meat sometimes, can't you? Um, for me, what would work with it, some, some tapas again, that tapas would probably have to be prawns grilled with some paprika or something like that to give it some backbone and some spice. Would work lovely with that. Um, now both these wines are young and they've got good acidity, so you could age either one of them uh, two, three years. This one I wouldn't really need to age though, to be honest, you can drink it now. Same with the Descoberta, they're both lovely drinking right now. They're young wines and they're probably supposed to be drunk fairly young. I think the Descoberta you could age a couple of years and it wouldn't hurt it at all, it'd be quite nice. This one doesn't really need it. It's not harsh, it's pretty easy going. I'll just drink it, to be honest. Um, right guys, I'm gonna wrap up, let you guys drink your wines. I am very interested to learn, um, know what you think of them both. I don't know if you'll prefer one or the other, but let me know what you think of them both. Let me know what you think of the styles and let me know if you think we should get them into the bar, one of them, you know, if you really love one of these, let me know, let's get it in. Um, as always, Next week, I'll be posting the grape on Monday that we're gonna be talking about next week. Um, if you do wanna get on board, as you've done this week, let me know as soon as you can, guys. And uh, yeah, talk to you all next week. Have a great weekend.